Hey, welcome everybody back to the Operators Podcast. Today you've got Matt, Jason, and Mike with you. Sean is uh, currently in a dumpling eating contest in China. And so uh, he said he is having to tap out. We will catch him next episode. We're going to talk uh, about all kinds of things and we're going to get a great panzerism this week. But I want to thank our sponsors who make it possible for us to bring you this content every single week. That is Fulfill, Sinlane, and North Beam. We are thankful for all of them and the investment they've made in the pod and also the fact that they make outstanding products that will help you to grow your business. We cook and we love to like spend time in the kitchen. Everybody does. Mm -hmm. But that this like own room where all of the food and all like our pantry's yeah. awesome. Yeah, but we're like, doing a we're doing thing. a big pantry with with stuff in it, but that's just making me think like maybe we should make it even bigger. Dude, it's just, ours is the size of a bedroom. Yeah. Man, that's yeah. awesome. How many square feet total? Not basically? big. Like our home's um thirty six hundred square feet. Okay. Like yeah. You just put floors. a lot of it in the kitchen. Kitchens, the like kitchen just ha- takes up a lot of space. It's the like I'm a Italian family, right? It's the heart of the home. Yeah, yeah. So like, we spend so much time in the kitchen, and we tend to like over engineer there relative to everywhere else. Like our bedroom is crazy simple. Like there's nothing elaborate about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, yeah, bathrooms another one that like my wife is like, let's invest a lot in our bathroom. Um, that's like her space kind of thing. So yeah, man, I, like big pantry. And then Jason, cause I'm a wine guy. Um, our, I've got like a built in glassed in wine cellar in the middle, also in the middle of the home. Mm, yeah. You yeah, posted yeah, yeah. a picture of that on Twitter. That looked awesome, man. Yeah. And that's just like, <laughs> we live in a wine region where wine and food people. So we kind of like said, okay, like what are the things we like, where are we going to spend the most time we're going to entertain people. Like, what do we care about? Right. The backyard is insane. That's yeah, your like, views are unbelievable. Yeah. Everything was built around the views and then kind of inside everything was built around like kitchen, wine, pantry, like living there. The rest yeah. of it kind of took a backseat. May have to come up for a site visit, Matt. May have to come out to Mike's too <laughs> to see. Yeah. yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait to come visit you guys. We'll do an operator yeah. sometime. Pod, uh, live. Yeah. We'll do a pod. Yeah. yeah. We'll do a rotating yeah. pod. On yeah, location. We, um, our place is going from it's pretty small right now it's like 24 50 square feet yep and we're adding about 1500 square feet yeah to it yep. and i'm just yeah. not a big fan of like huge homes i don't know about you guys but like i i don't just I, in general i'm a, like my wife and i we used to have like a 6000 square foot house and that was insane um, mm-hmm. back in ontario and then we like decided let's just get rid of a lot of stuff and let's just go to like the things we care about, like things that have stories, like yeah. really well chosen, well curated. And yeah. then, you know, less space and less space is a forcing function to like less stuff. Man, less space is such I, w- a I wish that was true in my family. I, that, that has not been the case with my family. It's just been, there's just more things I'm stepping over every day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Mike, you've got more kids. I've only got one kid too. Right? Oh man. So let me yeah. tell you, and this is the, this is God's honest truth guys, that the number one thing I'm excited about moving into a new house, it's, it's not the house at all. It's that it is going to force us to give away like truckloads of stuff to Salvation Army and some other charities. There's so much stuff when your kids, like when your kids are young, man, there's like, there's Dude. so much just huge plastic stuff and and there's so many things that they they kind of accumulate and we've just we haven't kind of processed through all that stuff even though our kids are out of that phase and so it's coming. There's a there's a massive giveaway coming. I mean, Jason, <laughs> you're you're out of it at this point. Your kids older, right? So like yeah. uh you know, my daughter's 8 and most of our stuff is because of her. Um yeah. but I will say like Mike, one of the things we do is like we let her so she gets the money from whatever she sells of mm. her things. Smart. Right? So it's like, you know, if she doesn't like things or she's no longer using them, because kids want to keep everything. Everything's important to a young, yeah. a young kid. Mm-hmm. But, you know, now the incentive is like, do you really need that thing? Like that was a toy from when you were three. Yeah. Right? That's it's smart, like sell man. It for and two you're bucks, teaching. And she gets to keep the two bucks. 
so now she's like she's very into this whole process of like mm -hmm. less right um so it, it's just these little hacks man for getting rid of stuff like we've been on a purge thing for like the last two years to just try to remove as many things from our life as possible which is weird because we sell things for a living um, <laughs> like like four years ago um four or five years ago when i moved out of my house in new jersey into an apartment in new york city i like got rid of everything and it was actually a really good feeling i regret giving getting rid of a few things like i had some really nice shoes that were old but in great shape like from Alden that I had when I was a lawyer that I oh. wish I, I had held on to. And like I throw out, threw out a set of golf clubs because I didn't play golf. I hadn't played golf in like 10 years. I just started playing again nine months ago, as we all know, because I talk about it a lot. Um, but Mike, I would love to compare notes with you about the process and the build and how, how you're doing it. We should schedule a call because Dude. we're just right there. And um, my friend uh, JJ had... He built the house like 12 years ago and he sent me this accountability spreadsheet that he used for making the payments to the builder. It was really, really cool. He's like, no, you get paid. This will distribute cash to you when things get completed. Like it's like a list of mm -hmm. every little thing that got completed mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just like paying an invoice at the end of the month because he's like, what happens is if you're just paying at the end of every month, they don't do anything in the first half of the month and then they just show up yep. and they just like hurry up for two weeks and they go to their yeah. other job. So anyway, yep. there's a lot there, but we should definitely. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Do you, do you guys think that uh, broadly speaking, do you think that people are moving more to like less stuff, but better stuff at a consumer level? Do you think that's going to be a long-term trend? It's, it's amongst my friends it is, but I don't Certainly really know. Certainly not in apparel. I mean, look at all these apparel <laughs> brands that are just like, you know, fast fashion. I mean, the, the prices are ridiculous. And uh, it's a shame Sean's not here today. I'm looking forward to his next app because I'd love to hear about his China trip. I mean, it just, oh. China's incredible. We're going to we're gonna start selling in China next year. And Ooh. so he's done a lot. Okay, of so little, tell us about um, that. How, how are you going to do it, Jason? I'm curious. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm so curious. Well, we have some partners over there that we're very close to um, because we do manufacture in China. Um, so, I mean, we also have a, a fellow who runs Asia for us who used to run um, a lot of Asia's business for Le Creuset, mm -hmm. which is a good brand. Um, and so yep. he's got, he's really focused on Japan, which we're launching November 9th, I think. Um, but once Ooh. we launched Australia, guys, we launched Australia and we did a million in the first month, which I was, wow. I was like pumped about. And, um, what's that, what drove that? Is that just like, is that the Gordon awareness effect? Like, cause like you need to have awareness to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, Gordon is big down there. Um, but okay. I think we've had, uh, I mean, Australia seems more e-com, more digital, right more yep. ahead of the, of the curve than say like the uk um on that and so and matt we finally launched canada we're up oh dude uh, I, I, I need to you i need no, to start being I, nicer I about send you so many customers like so many customers jason like i had friends over yesterday for dinner and they asked me specifically they're like what should we be looking for on black friday this month and i pulled out the hex clad pan and i'm like this d2c canada is up and running it started uh, and they were and these guys are like price insensitive they'll buy all your stuff mm -hmm. you know and like a, a lot of my friends have just been waiting like they, we get shafted on brands up here so much like they just don't actually try to sell in our market yeah. and we're like australia man like the canadian consumer is a good consumer so you know, okay, I, like, I have a question it, about that matt it's interesting what you just said that your friends are like Okay, what should we get on Black Friday? So to price, well, I want to hear you guys' thoughts on this. Price insensitive customers, and I haven't seen the research, so I, I don't know the answer to this. Are they, do they do a lot more shopping on the discounting days also? Oh yeah, because it's a sport. They're not doing it to save money. Mm -hmm. They're doing it for the entertainment value. Mm -hmm. Like that is like my wife and her friends, and it's like, it's the hilarious, the conversations. None of them need to wait until Black Friday, none of them, right? And they all love the sh like the event that is this holiday thing. And all they do is talk about like the best things that they're finding and like 
And it just becomes a sport for, for that kind of consumer. Like they don't give a shit. Like sh she couldn't tell you, none of them could tell you what they saved on yeah. any. Yeah. It doesn't matter. No. Um, and I think that that's like, a, that's a, that's the ultimate consumer, right? It's like the very top end of consumerism is like those price insensitive people, but that doesn't mean that they don't still get driven by like the deal. Um, yeah. Cause you feel like you, that. you did well, that you got more than you paid for just because totally. you bought it on sale. It It is amazing how relativistic we are as thinkers. Just like, this is like a part of the human condition that fascinates me. And, and we could talk about it across a lot of different dimensions, like how we can kind of ha we have the capacity to be happy or unhappy in just about any set of conditions, um, based on our mindset. Dude, um, you know what? I, on that note though, I don't know if you guys are experiencing this, but in my friend group, okay, the number of people that are talking about inflation and the cost of food and all these things. And I'm like, it's so, I like sit there, like I feel like a scientist watching this because mm -hmm. I'm like, all you are so rich. Like, what do you, what do you mean you're concerned with the price of food? Yeah. Like seriously. And they yeah. are. So like psychologically, while it doesn't materially impact them, it is having a psychological effect, even on this consumer that is so far up the food chain. They're still thinking about it. That blows me away. I've, I've thought about tweeting this out, but like, I, I've noticed this behavior in me and I'm sure you guys are the same way. You know, every day you're making decisions that are hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, decisions bigger than you, pretty much any decision in your personal life, except for maybe building a house. And then I go to Chipotle and I'm like, I wonder if I can find a way to get double meat without paying for it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll have steak and chicken. And they're like, is that double meat or half and half? And I'm like, I kind of wait till they've done the first full scoop. And I'm like, oh, make it half and half. You know, it's just so funny, like how we are. Have you guys seen this owl thing, the owl meeting thing? Yeah, we have that. Yes, that thing is awesome. So cool. Wait, it's a game that? changer. What yeah. is that, Mike? You got to check this out, Jason. It's like this so cool. uh, cylinder. And, and it's got speakers all the way around it. So instead of a speaker that you have to orient one direction, it's got speakers all the way around 360. And then it has cameras all the way around. And then the cameras do motion tracking. And basically, like, they'll show multiple people in the room. They show a panorama 360 view. And then it moves around based on who's talking. And it is, it's, it's kind of trippy. And it's also in, incredible. Like, they actually did it. They made, like... A I'm teleconferencing a product that is next level and it's super expensive. And I was like, I don't care. Take all my money. I just don't ever want, you know, an executive meeting blown up again, you know, while we wait on something. We were actually on with Jeroen from Fulfill and because like, you know, we got to learn. I, I, it's not genuine for us to have sponsors if we don't know anything about them because it's hard to recommend. Like you're listening to this show, you want to know that who is who we are recommending, we actually believe in. And we had a, I'm actually excited to do an episode with this guy because he's like clearly knows. His um, but look, fulfill. I'm stoked to have them as a sponsor simply because what he said to me before the episode really hit home. Um, when I asked him like, what is the sweet spot for somebody to work with you? right? Like when is a brand a good client for fulfill? And he immediately jumped into the complexity of a business. And I know that the, all of us as hosts on the show, we admire this. Um, and we really appreciate it because like every single brand, we talk about it all the time. We talked about this episode, like there's so many ways to grow a brand and that usually comes with some amount of complexity at some size and size isn't the determinator for working with a fulfill. And I really appreciated that perspective that he had. Um, and you know, we're going to do, we're going to talk personalization and you can talk about order volumes, like fulfill his purpose built for D to C after talking to him. I, I really get that now. So I have no problem recommending him. Matt, a really interesting thing is he immediately said who shouldn't work for him. I think we should like, yep. he's like, if you're a mattress company doing $10 million a year off of one website, he's like, I don't use fulfill. He's like, yeah, you he's have one you can't have value to your life. Which yeah. like, how nice is that to hear? Right. As a, as an operator, like this is what I like about when I, this when I, I get, I just become super fans of companies who can stand there and tell you who they are not for just as well as they can tell you who they are for. And I don't know. I'm like fulfill. I'm, I, I'm, I think I'm their in, ownership uh, structure matters right now. 
they they did they have basically bootstrapped. I think they took some money at the very very beginning, but they haven't taken all the Series A, Series B, Series C, and that allows them to grow the company at the rate that they think makes sense, where they're really able to serve customers. They don't have to hit some kind of benchmark yep. that a VC's hitting, uh, saying they've got to hit. And I think that makes a really tangible difference. You know, it's easy to underestimate what a superpower that is, having a really good cap table and having a, a you know a leadership team that's really devoted to serving customers more than hitting. Some some kind of arbitrary goal. I do have a, I, I want to go back, Jason, if you're cool with it, mm. this, your Australia thing. Yeah. Cause I think there's like actually a lot of lessons for people that unpack there. Do you, um, I wonder, and just give me your thoughts on this, but like, I would have an assumption that you're like, you guys have so many creators and influencers that use your product and mm. that talk about your product. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's not bound by geography. There's no targeting. So if like somebody has a million followers, like some percentage of them are going to be in Australia. Yep. Do you think that that is what enabled like you to just start in a market and hit the ground running is that there's already such broad awareness for the brand from so many different heads and faces? For sure. We, we, we know there's pent up demand in that, right? Because we were selling without even running paid ads at first. Like I think the first week we didn't run any paid ads and. Like we just literally put up the site and people were going and buying um, <laughs> <it's like> a, <laughs> for a week. We were just like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> nobody, nobody listened to anything Jason says. He doesn't know anything about e-commerce. It's too easy. He's <laughs> like up. playing with like a cheat code. Listen, I can tell you, tell you guys about life though. I might not be able to tell you about it. <laughs> that's, that's true. And golf. <laughs> no, there's a lot of things you can tell us. No, I, no, no. I have plenty Look, of life hacks, like... man. We have this thing called the panzerisms and they mean, they mean something. So. I, oh, dude, they mean a lot. I think like that's most of this game is actually that. Um, did you, uh, I don't know, did you guys see the the Aloe Yoga, Aloe Atelier thing that they launched? Like this high-end Aloe Yoga line? No. Like what kind of price points are we dude, talking? Dude, it's like $250 to $2,000 per item. Like $2, cashmere $2,000? $2,000. For like, like a pair of yoga pants? I, I don't know. It's like cashmere stuff. So like aloe went even more high end. Mm. <laughs> They're just They're like, going after those to completely price insensitive. Well, I don't even know. I don't even know when you're selling two thousand dollar pants if that's what it is. I don't even know if it's price insensitivity or if you're actually going through customers that are price sensitive the other way. I think there is a very very small band of customers that are price sensitive in that they only want to buy the most expensive stuff. I'm pulling this up right now. I think this is a brilliant are, move for them. Because yeah, like Aloe really grew out of big people. I think like Kardashian type people just like posting them because they like the product. Like Aloe has a good product. They have a good product. My wife wears yeah. Aloe. Um, they, they make nice stuff, good styling, and the quality seems acceptable enough. And so I'm looking at it right now. I think this is a brilliant move for them to just – level up their brand because they know that there are people with money. Look, Aloe has a store in the design district in Miami. It's like right next mm. to Louis Vuitton and Gucci. So that is definitely what they're going for. I think it's actually a really smart move. It's, I think it's brilliant, man. I do. Uh, and I'm with you. And I think there's actually a lot of people, whether they're price insensitive or not, I think a part of their identity is tied up and always buying the, the best thing. Right. And, and like I'm looking at it, it's like there's a three thousand dollar cashmere puffer that Aloe is selling. <laughs> 30, like thirty, like that's it's crazy. Uh, but it's also not. I mean, look, people people buy like make irrational purchasing decisions all the time. I think it's a really really smart brand move. And I wonder if it's also them reading the reading the room, like the macroeconomic environment. If you look at like all consumer spending data, is not awesome at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, you know, who, who tends to survive through these sort of like down, down consumer markets really well, high end luxury. Okay. So, Not but don't work. they usually say that luxury is the category that gets hit, you know, like spending gets cut first, like, or is it, I mean, th this was one of the things during COVID, they talked about how it was like not your typical recession and that the way that it hit different economic groups was really like the asset owners didn't really get hit. 
Um, so I guess it, I guess it depends on the type of the type of recession we would get. But I, I am curious to hear what you guys think. It's so hard, you know. You don't want to get into the game of trying to predict the economic weather. Nope. But man, a lot of people, and I certainly have gotten this sense, it just feels a little bit like, man, there's a storm of some sort coming. Like something's going to happen. There is going to be some kind of a major event or there is going to be some kind of a leg down. And it's it's really interesting that so many people have made that observation publicly and privately of just kind of having that sense and, and, you know, I think the the latest events in Israel, like we've got multiple wars going on in the world, like the, maybe there, you know, there's a lot of reason to, to feel uncertain. How do you, I mean, do you do anything different with your businesses? How do you plan for that? I mean, Jason, I'm curious to get your read. I mean, like you're, you're, yeah. you might be an exception to the yeah, rule. I think you're just we're capturing just, you know, we're riding a wave right now and, you know, we're not like arrogant or cocky about it. It's just like, I'm looking at 2024 planning right now. And we were just talking about this. Our, our C team um, had lunch reads together recently. And there's all these things that we can do. But the, but the question is like, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Um, do we want to go test this retail channel? You know, do we want to do a retail store? Uh, do we want to go mm -hmm. to China? Do we want to do Brazil? The Middle East. Like, what do we absolutely need to do right now? Like that's the way we're looking at it. And because, and, and I agree with Sean on this one, he always talks about like, it's just, it's not worth it to grow too fast. But I, our numbers are insane this year, but look, it's going to stop at some point, I think, um, unless we're, like really good at dropping just new products, um, which which we're working hard on. But so, no, I think there's a lot of tactics. There's a lot of things that we're going to need to do at some point, but none of them do we really need to do them. And it's it's because um, well, like I think we've got a lot. If we look at our website traffic, like I think there is a lot coming in Q4. Like we can see it. Mm. Like we can compare the increase in website traffic this year compared to the increase over last year as a leading indicator of what we're going to do this mm -hmm. year. And the numbers are mm -hmm. pretty darn good. So, but we, we're, we're in, we're in rare air and, and it's not cause we're smart. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not cause we're smarter than everyone else it's because, you know, we've got a great product and we've, we've executed well. There's another thing we were talking about just recently at lunch. It's like, um, someone sent around the Hello Bello uh, bankruptcy. That was you, Matt, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, it sounds like a restructuring to me. Like, I don't think the brand goes away, but I don't know their unit economics. But it's just different when there's someone, like, over your head saying, hey, um, we need to be profitable. We need to run a profitable business. Mm -hmm. Not every not every business needs to be that way. Some businesses are about, like, building up market share or building the brand first, knowing, like, that there's a lot on the com, like Lomi, composting to me. Yeah. They're talking about Lomi's, like New Lomi's York City. Yet, but like, yeah, New York City. It will be. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed, but one of my one of my favorite guys posted Lomi. Um, he's an influencer, Matt. Um, Brendan Fallis. He's in New York. Oh yeah, we like we like him Brent, a lot. Yeah. Brendan's a good friend um of Hexclad. Oh, cool. And so I was glad to see that. Um but like yeah. composting is is going to be required in New York. It's going to be required in California. So like everywhere, th there's a very like the whole U.S. is yeah, passing legislation. Yeah, like, so that's this tech play that you talked about, like in episode yeah. two or of the pod that um, that yeah. Lomi is doing. But but businesses like Hexclad or Simple Modern or Ridge, it's it's really important to have that discipline around profit to say like we're not we're not like opening. We're not creating a new category. Hexclad has redefined a category, but we haven't created a new sure. category. So it's like you got to have mm -hmm. the unique economics right, and you got to be focused on making money from day yep. one. The word that comes to mind is just thought leadership, and that's really what you want. You, it's not just about software; it's about the people designing and building that software and advising you on how to use that software to get the most out of your business. And the Sinlane team is obviously thought leaders in the messaging space. Uh, Jimmy regularly is posting on Twitter and giving insights of how you can be more effective at communicating with your customers on own messaging. And listen. 
We all know CPMs are only going up. If there's a core competency you have to develop, you have to get great at messaging, and Sendlane is an excellent option. We loved being there for a live operators pod. Hope everybody enjoyed listening to it, and we're thankful to have Sendlane as one of our sponsors. I've tried to invest in Sendlane. Like I've tried to figure out putting what your money where your mouth is. Jimmy will not let me on the cap table. I don't know why, but it's a product I believe in so much in this market that I am trying to put my own money into it. So Jimmy, this is a call for help. Let me invest in your software, dude. It's really good. This I think that point. applies to down markets too, Mike. Right? Like, yeah. you know, the oh, whole... You special, can't control maybe. the macro. And what, yeah, like all well, Jason... I mean, Jason, the thing that I take away from what you just said, man, is like you can... As operators, the only thing we can control is our inputs, right? And it's like, that's that's what execution is, is like just choosing the best inputs that you can throw into a business. Like, where do you put your resources? And you can't control the outputs. You try to have quality inputs so that you get quality outputs. Mm -hmm. But doesn't like the macro environment, I mean, you have to pay attention. So like, especially if you're buying inventory and things like that, you can try to read the market a bit. But the other thing I would take away that Jason just said is the, um, is this like leading indicator metrics, right? Like Jason's looking at site traffic year over year, heading into his busy season as a leading indicator. And I don't think a lot of operators are paying attention to like, what are leading indicator numbers? And there's no, there's no hundred percent correlation. I would never argue that, but you kind of have to learn to read your tea leaves guys. Like, Every business is different. We all have different leading indicators, but you need to find the ones that seem to be correlated with future performance for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's contrary to like most performance marketers out there. Yeah. Hope is, hope is not a great strategy. You know, we, you, you, you want to have <laughs> a plan that's consistent with what your leading numbers and, and your leading indicators are saying. And I, the point that you made about profitability, Jason, uh, just to underline it in a way, I've been talking with my team about this issue as well. I, I think one of the common characteristics of all four of us on the podcast is that we have brands that on the bell curve are kind of over on that far right side. And so our experience on a day-to-day -day basis and the numbers we're looking at are often different than the normative experience um, in, in e-com land or in consumer. And so uh, that worries me a little bit sometimes. Sometimes I just worry that in, in the same way that it's hard to be empathetic with another person if you just can't relate with their how they're situated, I, I get worried that when I'm not experiencing what most people are experiencing, that there's a way for me to become a little bit um, uh, skewed in my, my perspective. But in our category, I, I would think that a pullback in consumer spending would would really help us. I mean, we have a product that's priced more attractively than most of our premium competitors. And I was saying this to our CFO, you know, if our EBITDA had to take a step back and we make 60% of the EBITDA next year, but we gain market share, that's fantastic. You know, like, I mean, it wouldn't feel great to make less yep. money, but I don't need all that EBITDA. Again, I don't have a lifestyle that I've got to fund. I'm trying to play the longer game. And so there's a very good chance that for us, a recession strategically works in our favor and allows us to add share. Um, mm. But the privilege that we have is because we're profitable and highly profitable, we could take a, two steps back when everybody else in the market takes four steps back and we're ahead, you know? Yep. I like what you said, Mike, about you know your price point because it, plus you have great value for money and in sort of mm -hmm. the styling and the performance of the product. So I think you do do well in an environment where consumer is a little bit more jealously guarding their dollars. Um, I think we're on the other end of that, whereas we've just, we've got a, we're, people are making an investment when they're buying Hexlab. People are making an investment when they're buying Lomi. Um, maybe mm -hmm. Pila case is a little bit more like simple modern. I don't, I haven't studied it as much, Matt. No, I mean, look, Pila case is, um, I think I've, we've been playing a lot with this. Like what's the ideal price point for this product? Um, 
to unlock like the next wave of growth. Like that brand on its own should be a hundred million dollar a year brand. And it's just figuring out like where where do we live in this market? Like in its in its category, right? Um, and I've learned a lot watching Simple Modern do this in theirs. And I look at like it's a very similar sort of like people buy a lot of them for some reason. Um, like they collect them and it's very fashion driven. So like I kind of think there is a move for Peely Case where we do go a bit lower in entry price point, um, which we've been making moves on. And it actually is like having real meaningful impact. Like merchandising is a real lever for Pila Case as a brand. Um, and so is other markets. Like I'm blown away by the performance of certain markets around the world in that, in that category specifically. Um, so I guess like the, just to put a bow on this, I mean, you can't control broader macro consumer spending, but I think Mike, you're demonstrating an example of how to think about it as an entrepreneur, as an operator, just like, how do you react to the market? That matters a lot. Mm -hmm. And when you do control your own destiny and like, you're not look like Mike, what you just said is insane for any venture backed business, their investors would never be okay with that answer. And it's worth pointing like, out wait a minute. It, exactly the moment that it becomes less expensive to buy share and to make a move is exactly when your investors are going to be pulling back the reins and saying, no, 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 not growth, profitability now. There's this inverse correlation that when growth is expensive and everybody's thinking growth and the economy's good, the investors are like, grow, 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 grow. But the moment that the market turns, then they're like saying, whoa, 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 you know, you know, every, you got to make every dollar count, whatever. It doesn't matter if we lose share, we got to get to profitability. And I, I think there's just a larger thing here for, for everybody listening, which is the way that you do well in business is by doing something different than the crowd. And that is always difficult. It requires intestinal fortitude where you're, you're doing things that don't seem to make sense when you're doing them and that, that feels scary, but that's where the reward is. And so it's, it's interesting. You know, I mean, it's the same way with the stock market. It's like, you know, you, you, the way you make money in the stock market is by buying when everybody else wants to sell and selling when everybody else thinks it's, yep. it's going to continue going higher. I'll give one more example that we've done that I think is, is instructional. This. So we have, a I don't know if you guys have this, I'm sure you do. We have like a profit model that basically projects what we think is going to happen over the next, you know, one, three, five years, whatever. And the, the profit model is, is helpful for making decisions from a strategic planning perspective and from uh, inventory buying and liquidity. Um, I, I think there's a lot of different tools out there that people are using. And depending on the size of your business, probably the, the smaller your business, the shorter the time frame you're looking at with your modeling. But at this point, now that we've broken into really, really strong profitability, we've been asking the question of what is the purpose of this tool? How do we want to use it? And, uh, because we're not running tight on, you know, there was a point where it's like, well, we need to be right. Cause you know, if, if we get it wrong, we run out of money and game over, but now that's not the situation. So we're asking the question of like, how do we use it? And what's interesting is we're no longer trying to accurately predict the future as much as we're trying to run scenario analysis and basically plot out the bell curve of outcomes and understand if, under these different outcomes, where would we be situated? Like, so, okay, for example, um, I mean, and sure, we have like a median case of like, here's what we think could happen. Here's the 50th percentile outcome. Um, but then what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll say, okay, let's say consumer spending pulls back 10%. Let's say that leads to margins or margins going down 8%. Let's say the exchange rate moves against us and it goes to 695 you know, RMB to the USD or whatever. And okay, what happens, right? And what, what does that do to our liquidity? What does that do to our balance sheet? And so it allows us to stress test our business for different scenarios. And like you said, Jason, we don't see any like harbingers in our data of that. We don't, we don't see any numbers where it's like, okay, that's a scary number. But what, what it allows us to do is it allows us to understand that even if we were to get caught off guard by like a sudden, you know, down move, 
Um, and pretty much what we've come up with with our business is that for us to really have a problem would require for for us to be able to reinvest all of our capital would require something worse than the great financial crisis, you know, to happen, which right. could could certainly happen. But you're talking about okay, statistically, like you're you're pretty protected. So anyway, I thought that was really interesting of how your tools and the way you use your tools changes at different points in your life cycle, like you know, Jason, where you guys are at, and because you are growing so rapidly, you probably use your tools a little bit differently than each of us and than a bunch of people listening. But I think that that's, that's part of being a good operator is understanding not just what is the tool set that you use to do your job, but also depending on how your company is situated, how that tool can be helpful to you in running the business. So Mike, this is, you just perfectly teed up today's panzerism. So, so let's oh, do let's it. Oh, let's go. You you let's, you let's talk about investors and the fickleness of investors, and the panzerism is this: play the long game. Play the long mm-hmm. game. What reminded me of this as I was um, I was talking to a, a guy at another brand who I really like, and um, he contracted with an agency, and they had a specific project, and it didn't go really well. Um, but the agency is a great agency. Like not all projects go great, right? For some reason, something went wrong, product market fit, brand, yeah. whatever. And it's like, okay, whose fault is it? Everyone loves blaming the agency. Um, and I, mm-hmm. I would think in this circumstance, actually the agency is at least partly at fault or at least half the fault, right? But like, if you know they're good agency, you know they're good people. Do you want to just like go beat the guy up and get something extra and like burn the relationship? Or do you want to let the guy stew over the fact that the project wasn't as successful as everyone had hoped so that in a couple months or whatever, they come back around and they're like, you know, I really, we, we, we want to, we want to help. We like, we want to, con- that, that's what I mean by playing the long game. It's like, it's like what I talked about building a bank of favors. It, it's kind of the same thing. Mm. I think there's just like, there's so much short term thinking and a lot of it comes, and it's very similar to what you talked about with investors, right? Like, people are irrational. People are irrational. We keep giving people too much credit for being rational. We're all animals. Like, look at what's going on in the Middle East right now. This is like animal stuff. It, investors yep. are irrational. And and we keep thinking that we're... we're human beings are not animals. Human beings are animals. So you actually have to check yourself and be like, okay, hang on. Am I being an animal here or am I being rational? And like, I need, and then, and the only way to do that is to say, hey, should I be playing the long game here? You don't always play the long game. Sometimes you got to make short-term decisions. But like the point about investors being irrational, um, and it, I saw this in the dot-com era. You know, I left Skadden in 2000 and go work for a dot-com company. We raised $15 million. The investors were giving us money. It was all good. Toronto Dominion was one, was one of the investors, actually. <laughs> that may be why I like to make taxes Very cool. Canadians, man. But, um, <laughs> but like, you know, we raised like 15 million in venture money and, and then one day it just stopped. They just turned it that, they just turned it off. And um, we wound up selling the company. Um, and the outcome was not great for the investors. It was okay for management, but you know this pushing. It's the same thing. Like what what we we keep talking about. It. We've seen it. Like all the companies, all the D 2 C companies. Look at Hello Bello. Look at All Birds. Look at all. It's going to be interesting to see what comes down soon. But but fundamentally, you have to be better, and you have to play the long game, or at least consider. Whether or not, hey, am I, am I neglecting the long game in my decision making? So that's the panzerism of the day. Matt, what do you have to say about that? Dude, I'm such a fan of, uh, of patience in this game. Like, it, we, we discount as entrepreneurs um, time in the oven too mm-hmm. much. Like we just, we don't allow things to bake for long periods of time. And I think it's a cultural problem. Like I actually think that 
Um, like I couldn't agree more with you, by the way. I just like building great things takes time. 99, 99.99% of the time, you are not going to have a hex clad where you get lightning in a bottle and you go from like zero to the moon really fast. You know, so like you go, like if you're going to play the odds in this entrepreneur game, then you should default to this is going to take time. That's a good thing, right? Like the half-life of a company is a real, like, so that as long as it takes you to get to your peak is as long as it takes you to go to zero. So like, I think defaulting to be patient, be patient and ask that. I ask the question always, uh, the question I asked Jason is, um, will this matter in a year? Yep. Mm. Yeah. Right. And if it, and if it doesn't, then like, why the hell am I like, why yeah. do I care? You know, like if something went wrong, is it going to matter in three months? Am I going to remember this in 60 days, 90 days, a year from now, you know, and often that just comes down to like, we get so impatient in the short term and that we forget that we're actually trying to be very, very patient long-term. Mike, what do you think um, about the panzerism of the day? Guys, everyone on the podcast uses North Beam, okay? Like I use Fulfill, I'm trying to invest in Sendlane, and I use North Beam. I'm the trifecta here. Why do we use North Beam? Well, we're going to Q4, and if you spend a lot of money on paid media, right? So I'm talking probably multiple millions on Facebook in a month in November, you need a source of truth reporting hourly to accurately pivot budgets and campaign spend. And that one feature alone, my whole paid media team logs into it, my whole creative team logs into it, and they can see which ads are driving sales, you know, creative, whatever, on an independent basis with real-time data, and then pivot budgets accordingly. And in a month like November, you can end up saving 80 grand in an hour or something crazy, right? Uh, so it's a great time to use North Beam going into Q4. It takes a learning curve. You better sign up early because you don't want to be trying to learn how to do it in the Wednesday before Black Friday. It won't be any value to you then. You, you have to be integrated into the system. You need data. You need to learn how it works. I think they actually have a mastermind coming up next week. Uh, and if if this, you're listening to this past next week, whenever that date might be, just find Austin on Twitter, hit him up, and he'll 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 do a one-on-one -on -one demo with you to make sure you understand how North Beam works. Uh, so thank you, North Beam, for being a sponsor. They also have a mixed media modeling tool, which this only applies for the big boys in chat. If you're spending $10 million a month, you need a mixed media modeling tool. And if I'm the first guy to tell you that, how the fuck did you get to $10 million a month in spend? Like, I'm too dumb for you to take advice from me. But that is that is the next level. Attribution tool first, then mixed media modeling. And Northbeam can carry you through that. Well, I mean, I think the people that are the most successful usually are the people that have the longest view. And one one story and then a thought we have two different retailers that in the last year we've moved into deeper partnership with, uh, but where it has taken years to align, years to align on how we're going to partner together. And some of that has been due to this gap between their perception of our the value of our brand and our perception of the value of our brand. And we feel like we felt like our brand was more valuable than they were giving us credit for. And there were opportunities where we could have struck a deal with them that we would have made money. I mean, we would have made good money at the deal that they were proposing, but it undervalued our brand. And we were willing to wait and to walk away from that. And say, no, we want to partner when you understand the value that we bring to the table as a, as a brand. And it, in one case, took years really for them to see that, but they finally came back around and now we're doing the right deal. And to your point earlier, Jason, just to tie this to something we just said, you know, which I guess, I guess it's kind of a circle because you, you said it tied to it, but I just want to make the connection clear to everybody. When you're profitable, it's easier to be patient. It's easier to have a long view when you're profitable because you don't feel like you have to make something happen. And I, I think there's a good question that we can all ask ourselves, which is, 
what are the times when I am more likely to be uh, impetuous or impulsive in my decision making? Right. Because like the opposite of having a long view is being impulsive or short term in my thinking. And nobody would say, you know, I want to be a really impulsive thinker. I want to be really short term. But we all do it. And so some of self-awareness is understanding what are the situations where I can tend to be more impulsive or I can tend to be, you know, not take the long view. One of the ways that I would really challenge that I challenge people all the time is when it comes to relationships, taking the long view in relationships and for, you know, it's for all of us, this is one of the easiest places to be a short-term thinker. That person said that thing and that made me angry. That pissed me off. And so I'm just gonna let them have it. Or man, that project, that is not acceptable. That outcome sucked. And I'm going to tell everybody that it sucked. You know, I'm going to tell everybody exactly how angry I feel right now. And when we feel those emotions, it's really easy to just give in to them. But what they do is they're just incredibly corrosive to relationships, which, uh, you know, so much of being successful in business is building good relationships with people, the people you work with, the partners that you, and, and you mentioned this, Jason, but the future is a long time. Like you never know how things will change in the future. And the people that you, you did a, a deal with you know, 20 years ago, and then 20 years later, you're, you're needing to work with them again in a different context. And so I, I would say one way that I try to be exceptionally deliberate here is really taking the long view with people. And I've been accused before of being, uh, when somebody's not working out, being too slow to fire uh, or some other things. And I'm sure there's people listening to this that would be like, yeah, you know, like that's a, that's a mistake, Mike, that's a character flaw. But my argument would be that when people get the sense that you're not going to be transactional and short-sighted with them, you know, not that you're going to give them an infinite rope, but that you're not going to be short-sighted and that you're going to actually give them every opportunity. It really builds a sense of loyalty that over years as that compounds is a pretty important thing. So uh, it's great panzerism, Jason. So what is, what's the, what's the, uh, isn't there like the business move? There's a quote or something, right? Business moves at the speed of relationships and relationships move at the speed of empathy or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I love what you're saying, Mike, because I think like it's very easy as an entrepreneur to get, to get short, like a little short termism mm -hmm. with relationships when those are probably the things that like, it's the one thing I think I've said this a thousand times to so many people, like it's the only thing I could lose everything and just have that. You and nailed I it, know Matt. I would be fine. The short termism of really of short termism of relationships. You you nailed it. Nailed it. So all right. I Yeah, we call it Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say we, we talk about it all the time being relational instead of transactional. Mm -hmm. Because transaction being yeah. transactional with people is being short term, just what can you give me right now? And relational is like I value you as a person and I value your perspective and yes, we have to work together and there are things that need to be accomplished, but it's not just about give me what I want and then I'm done with you. I was, uh, I was on a flight earlier today and was, um, thinking about, um, a thread, uh, for Twitter cause I haven't written one in a while. And I was just really thinking it, it came to me because of, um, just evaluating some of the strategic ob objectives that we had at the beginning of this year and thinking about mm -hmm. how we're doing. And I remembered my, my five strategic objectives that I started with at the beginning of the year. And we've actually done a really great job on many of them, which is really surprising. So I was wondering if you could pick one strategic objective that you set for at the end of the year that you think uh, that, and how, and how it's doing. Well, one of the things that, that we do, uh, Jason, is basically like we get together as an executive leadership team and we talk about the business and, hey, where do we, you know, where do we want the business to be? Um, and we, we kind of get aligned on that. And then uh, once we get aligned on that, I kind of take all that and I spend about a month thinking about, okay, what do I want to what do I want to do with that in terms of turning it into OKRs? And then I, I turn it into OKRs 
And then I share it with the whole team in January. And then, you know, everybody builds their kind of goals around it. But then I have a check in in the middle of the year where I look through everything that we've, um, you know, that we've had as a priority and basically say, hey, how are we doing? I kind of do a report card of like, are we on pace? Did we miss the mark? You know, do we have an unrealistic goal here? What, how do I, how do I feel like we're doing? And, um, and then also I try and connect it to the vision of here's why these are important. They're not just important because they're bullet points on a list. They're important because if we accomplish these things, this is where we get, this is the better future that that leads us to, which I think is, it's an important step. So one that I would say was huge for us is we had an OKR that was titled, I'll just read you what the OKR was. The OKR was, um, fuel current and future growth through product pipeline. And then we had a bunch of very specific key results where it's like, okay, these are all the things we need to accomplish in order to feel like we've got a full product pipeline and we're set up to be, you know, releasing products constantly and really proud of how we've done there. I mean, I think we've built the there's all these areas in the organization that I still see where I think we can get stronger. But one of the places where I think we've gotten best in class is that we just do a great job of bringing so much new product to market Mm, and the ground game behind that, the product development and manufacturing and logistics and growth team. Um, you know, I think I mentioned this, I think we've probably launched something like a thousand to 1500 SKUs this year, some, you know, just some, but what's even, even more exciting is that we've got a ton more that's in the pipeline. So I look at that and I'm like, I'm really proud of it. And what's great is that because we did a good job with that, I think we've developed a lot of those organizational muscles and now we can focus on another area without that kind of falling by the wayside. You know, that's what you hope to do. I think when you're doing strategic planning is you, you have an area that you focus on, but you hope to build it up in a way where when the focus changes, that area doesn't just fall apart, that that area is like a new capability that you have. And so um, for us, it's it, it's been a massive tailwind. And I think it's also some of the things that we are still growing in, like marketing, have been offset by the fact that we've been so good in new product launches because the new product launches have driven so much organic exposure on TikTok and Instagram and other places and so much organic demand. Uh, so anyway, that'd be well, one of my, what about you? I mean, you? You said say, yours have gone well. Yeah, I'll say Mike, by the way, like we hired a new head of HR and she's walking around with her simple modern, you know, drink. Uh, Love it. And uh, her bottle holder, her bottle. Um, what do you call it? Cup. Sorry, Jesus. Old man brain. Her simple modern <laughs> cup, right? And it looks really sleek and cool it Mm. really really does so um Mm. i I think you guys are really crushing it with the new product and the look and feel i even like the logo and the branding i must say i know we talked about branding with you guys but um it may be i don't think you need a re re overhaul i think you need maybe a little bit of leveling up but anyway it looks really good um i set the set up this this year 2023 i had five objectives i think we're pretty far along on all of them but i will say the one that i the two that i'm most proud of one is like i feel a lot more under control going into um bfcm this year than we did last year um and Mm -hmm. that's due to really Mm -hmm. leveling up our ops um but the one that i think is really cool is that this time last year we had no growth team at all the growth team was mm. me. Um, this this guy Ben Kochavi, who is amazing. Uh, he was a consultant. Um, his he's got an agency, but I just kind of hired him as like my my whisperer, my ecom whisperer. Um, and then we had a bunch of agencies, you know, Homestead, Sharma, and and Niles, my chief of staff, who's now our COO. And now we have a head of growth. We have two directors of paid media. We have a head of retention and we have an e-com manager. We just hired a, um, a head of uh, paid social creative and we have a, a head of mm. overall um, content creation at Hexclad. All these people were hired in 2023 and uh, 
it's amazing that they've all worked really well. We've had one bad hire this year. The person was around for six months and then pieced out because they knew probably that they just weren't good enough for the rest of the team. Um, nice person, but just wasn't for them. And I'm just so proud of that. We went to the Marketing Land Conference, Connor Roland and I, and we did a little um, talk there. It was great. Um, the conference was great. Um, and just listening to Connor talk, it's like, wow, we have just, we went from no team to all-star team, and I'm so happy that we waited until we could find the right person. And the last thing I'll say on the topic, mm -hmm. then this is self-serving, is that I am going to hire next year a head of growth to cover all of international and like bookend Connor Roland. So anyone out there listening, spread the word. Um, they could be in the UK, they could be in the EU, they could even be in Asia, but we, we're, we're hiring a head of international growth. It's interesting that your answer, um, m my answer when I was talking about the product pipeline and stuff, the person who plays a really key role in that and kind of quarterbacks all that is our, our chief growth officer, who's Corbin, we've had him on the show before. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was in licensing before that moved him over, but man, it is, it is just invaluable to have somebody in the organization that all they're thinking about is how are we growing and setting up future growth? One of the things that, that we did, I mean, I think Jason, you guys have grown with grace, which is really difficult to do. It's, it's difficult, like you said, for it to not just be a mess when you're growing as quickly as, as you are, but when you and I talk about your strategy and where you're headed, what I hear is not just an, a brand that's growing really fast right now, but where you have plans for the next one, two, three years about how you're going to continue to grow. And you're putting the infrastructure in place to do it really well. And I, I think some of that is making the decision, like you said, taking the longer term view of, hey, the goal is not how do we maximize our growth rate in 2023? It's how do we build the best and biggest business, you know, over the next 10 years or whatever. And that's served you really well. All right, guys, that is a wrap. But I want to thank our sponsors who make it possible for us to bring you this content every single week. That is Fulfill, Sinlane, and North Beam. We are thankful for all of them and the investment they've made in the pod and also the fact that they make outstanding products that will help you to grow your business. 